Gamer Podcast, episode 18. We just got back from PAX Unplugged, the first PAX just for tabletop games, and we're going to talk all about it. Here with me today, we've got the whole gang. We've got Orion. Yo, what's up? We've got Matt. Hello. We've got Ben. Hello. All the way over in Pennsylvania, we have Wes. Hi there. I'm not in Philadelphia. I'm in Pittsburgh. In Pittsburgh, yes. And in Connecticut, we have the second person named Matt, but we call him Bubba. Hello, say, say hello, Bubba. Hello. And we have a billion topics about PAX. So what I decided to do this time was to take all the topics, a giant list of them, throw them into a metaphorical hat that is actually an Excel spreadsheet with a randomizing function built in. And I'm just going to throw topics at you guys. Sound good? Sounds good. Uh, I guess I should say what PAX Unplugged is for those who don't know. Yeah, PAX... wait, wait. Before, before we jump completely into this, I feel like I need to explain the reason why I said I'm in Pittsburgh, not Philadelphia, is because PAX Unplugged was an amazing convention in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and it reminded me why no one goes to Philadelphia. People only <laughs> leave. Yeah, Philadelphia wasn't the nicest looking big city I've been in, but... The PAX convention started as video game conventions by the creators of the Penny Arcade webcomic, and they now have four different PAXs for mainly video games, but tabletop games became such a big thing in those, particularly in PAX East, which is up here in Boston, that they decided to make their fifth and what they say is their final PAX of every year, uh, which is PAX Unplugged, entirely dedicated to board games and dice games and RPGs and anything played on a table. You guys were ripping on Philadelphia, but to Philadelphia's credit, I saw more Steelers gear than any Philadelphia sports gear. So <laughs> it had that going for it. So and even the residents don't like living there. That's supposed to be a plus for Philly? <laughs> the plus for Philly clearly, clearly. is that there is a lot of Benjamin Franklin memorabilia because he lived there and he is my great, 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 great grandfather. Or Ooh. something. No, that's it. So there's seven greats. Seven? Okay. I Kings. thought you just like said an arbitrary number of greats. No, <laughs> no there are seven. Okay. Because his daughter married a beach, and then it's just beaches all the way down to me. Okay. Beaches all the way down. Just beaches all oh, the way down. So you'd be a less so favored guy. One of them the was a vice president. Ooh. All right. Yeah. No, Philly yeah, was yeah, fun. Got, we walked views. around the first night. We saw the Liberty Bell. We did not lick it. Uh, People do that? Is that it's, that's a thing? It's a thing from How I Met Your Mother. Oh. They go to Philly and lick the Liberty Bell. That Wait, really? Like a yes. Strange thing to Does do. literally anyone else do that? No. That's why it was special <laughs> for that. All right, then. Because they had to do something. Whatever. Never mind. <laughs> Philly was fun. I enjoyed walking around. It was spread out enough. It wasn't eating me like Manhattan does. That's true. Yeah, yeah. It's not as big as New York. The train was good. Yeah. That's yeah. actually one of the topics. We'll talk about the train in a really? bit. <laughs> All right. Ready to jump into the list of randomized topics? Yes. Wes, you're going to like this one. Actually, I'm just going to let you yep. talk about this one because you discovered what... I discovered at PAX East last year and what most people discovered like four years ago, and that is Star Realms. Okay, wow. Star Realms is not four years old. Hold on. I'm going to look this up. I take offense. I mean, uh, I only discovered it like eight months ago, so. Okay. so. Star Realms. There's a lot of hanging out at, at PAX, lines and meals and stuff. It was so kickstarted we, in 2013. We, That's crazy. Yeah, I literally just saw that. Yeah, wow. Star Realms is like the best play at the cafeteria table game. Yeah, it's super. Yeah, it super absolutely cool. is. Um, I I fell in love with it because it's basically. I mean, it, to my mind, it's Dominion without all of the hassle. Travel size. Um, yeah, travel Dominion. It takes like twenty minutes to play, and I don't know. It, I, I I like the lore. Green is overpowered. I may just take green out of the game completely. I like but the progression that you went through from this is my favorite game in like two years and it's better than everything else. I want to play it all the time to green is overpowered and I'm taking them out. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, I do that. Like, Orion, you, you should know this about me, that I am a volatile personality. And... <laughs> 
Yes. I was enchanted initially. I thought the gold, red, and blue were were pretty cool. The, the the Federation, the Empire, and the Machine Cult, I guess, is what they're called. And then the Blob comes in, and the Blob just ruins everything. It's fair. Yeah. The Blob just takes an enormous steaming dump on everything that you've ever built and everything that you ever loved, <laughs> and then no, it ruins the, your chances well, of getting the better thing. things you because need... it trashes things in the buy zone. Well, that and... The, the important thing about the, the blobs is that they basically don't have any money. So you need some other way to get income, which is either thinning out your deck with red or getting money with blue. I've always found yellow to be the most underpowered of the four, although I have seen yellow strategies work. But once you find some way to get consistent amounts of money, you just have to buy green because it's so strong. It's just so I have a- dollar for dollar. It does more damage than anything else. And in a zero-sum two-player game like this, where you're trying to reduce their health to zero, green is the best thing you can buy. Yeah. And it draws cards. So I actually have a quick aside about this. So I got into this game through Hero Realms, which is almost exactly the same game, just kind of uh, a, a different theming of it. And it has the exact same problem, where just the military-based faction is overpowered, and it just becomes not fun to play. But uh, the only thing I bought at PAX Unplugged this time around was a couple what they call faction decks and a boss deck. And I, I just played them yesterday, and they actually make the game... They, they change the game up enough that you just don't see the overpoweredness anymore. Yeah, it just changes the game so that you're fighting against a boss instead of each other. So you're actually going for the most overpowered cards and you're not caring about what the other player is doing. It's cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's yeah, probably I, the best I picked iteration. up that scene pack for Star Realms too. Okay. Have you played it yet? I haven't actually played it, but um, I don't know. Orion was talking about the, the emotional progression that I went through with this game. I think that the reason why I went through that progression was because I really do love Dominion very much. And it brought me back to the the hinter days of Dominion when I was first introduced to it. And I was like, oh my gosh, this game is the best game ever. I love it so much. And it's an amazing card game. And now I feel like anytime I play Dominion, it takes 20 minutes to set up. And we have to pull out the app and get the perfect, you know, optimization of the of the market. Or not the market, but like the, the buy field. And then we're playing it. And then everybody gets these enormous decks. And we have to sort it all at the end. And it, it, it almost like the game gets overshadowed by this ritual of setting it up and tearing it down that it feels so unnatural and breaks the pacing of it so much that I, I have a hard time with it now, I guess. Yeah, that's fair. And the Star Realms just bypasses that completely. Because it's... Yeah. Well, and everything just goes in one giant deck at the end. It, it's a good game. Like it, I, I, I wrote this in my review, like... The biggest positive to Star Realms is, is just that it's so portable. And because it's fun. It's a fun game. It's not a brilliant game. It does some things really well, but it has these kind of balance issues that you know harm it if you're going to play it like hundreds of times, I think. But as a game to like just carry around with you, it's perfect. Yeah, I agree. All right, moving on to our next randomly selected topic. We have Wandering the Expo Hall, which is one I added to the list. Did anyone else just kind of wander around and look at the booths in the expo hall? Yeah. Yeah. What what was your impression? It was so much easier wandering the expo hall at this show compared to PAX East. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, it was 20% the size or something. Yeah, something like that. But even then, I think the aisles were even larger relative to the number of people. There was was more space in general. And there were less people. And just fewer people. Fewer people, yeah. Yeah, you could generally walk without constantly being jostled by everyone else. <laughs> oh, and also, I'm going to sound like a really curmudgeon person, but the fact that there are fewer cosplayers with very bulky costumes helped tremendously as well, I think. <laughs> there was some good cosplay. I saw yeah, a Tracer did. cosplay, but that was not relevant to the con. Did, did you see the girl with the like six-foot wings on either side of her? Yes. No. <laughs> I think I saw that. 
so obnoxious. If you want to talk about the epitome of un- ridiculous, much space taking up cosplay, yeah, like this girl had to prep for doors. I'm sure. Like it was, <laughs> I, it, it was like she had to see the door coming, activate the targeting computer, angle her <laughs> yaw in such a way to actually slide through the door. Yeah, that's got to be so annoying. I, I, yeah. Anyway, I thought the expo hall was just really fun because, like, you have like the heavy hitters in board gaming, but they're not like on the same level as like Sony at PAX East, right? So, like, the heavy hitters had bigger booths, but still, it was usually just a bunch of tables set up with cool board games, and then you, you had the same thing at the indie places it was just smaller maybe they had one table well if you look at the map basically if the smallest booth was a size one the biggest booth was a size four like right it was, it was four times the size and that was it i think simon had two of those fours but they had two of them yeah yeah so like yeah them and fantasy flight and aries and all the really big publishers they had maybe maybe what 20 feet by 15 feet Maybe more than that. A little more than that, but but I mean enough for like five tables and but even a stack, you know, stacks of games and a place to check out. Even the big it. the big vendors, I thought it was cool. Like it was primarily tables with board games on them. You know, nothing. It's less glamorous, ostentatious, ostentatious. Yeah. Like we're there to enjoy board games, and like that's what we got at all the booths. Um, so in that regard, I had more fun walking the expo hall at this conference than just about anything else I've been to. Yeah, I would agree just in terms of layout, but I set aside like an hour just to wander through and just look at things. And I didn't even get through the whole expo hall because every game looked the same. There were a few standouts that we'll talk about, things that really stood out to us. But I saw a bunch of, I saw a few crass party games. I saw a whole bunch of like small card games and then I saw a bunch of minis games like miniatures based games and that was about it. Like did any of you guys see like a new Euro on the hall? Unless you count the new Civ game. Yeah, but even then that's a heavy like there's that, a lot that, of minis in there. Yeah, that's true. It, it, it was, Actually, it wasn't very mini based. It was just an Ameritrash war game, though. Yeah. It, I, and I guess that's the function of us actually being in America and not in Europe. And there, <laughs> I know there were tons of Essen, but I don't know. It concerns me a bit that board gaming seems to, like, the, the, the glut of new games seems to be minis games or small card game. Well, also, the, the booth that was just reskins of Catan really kind of got under my skin. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> What it was, was, it was a whole like the, big the Game of Thrones one? It was all, yeah, it was dedicated to like four different versions of Catan. And the, the biggest, like, the one that they were showcasing was Game of Thrones Catan. Well, I think that's because, wait, didn't Asmodee buy the Catan license and then basically make their own subsidiary just to sell Catan games? There's something like that. I don't know. Where like Catan is basically its own company now. I almost feel like under the Super Asmodee board game conglomerate. I think so. Maybe okay. I, I could be wrong there. I almost feel like Catan is like the new Monopoly, where it's not like this revolutionary game, but it's just unreasonably popular and gets all of these it's stupid spinoffs. Yeah, spinoffs. Exactly. Yeah, it's it, it's gentrified Monopoly. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Catan is a better game than Monopoly, and I, I, I probably have played more Catan than anyone else on the podcast, but it's I, not... I would, I would yeah. wager money that Domino's is a better game than Monopoly. <laughs> like, I've played some pretty cool Domino's iterations, actually, with my grandparents. All right, maybe I'm the dissenter here. I think it's fine that Catan had a big booth, and they're reskinning it, like... To me, that's cool. It's it's almost like, you know, it's like the big name. It's the big name of board gaming. It's yeah, the big yeah. name that's going to be there forever. I think it's cool that at a convention, they're there showing their updated themes <laughs> to the game. I said, like, I would never buy it, but I think it's kind of cool. I think, I think it kind of, honestly, I think it's probably healthy for the industry 
to have that aspect. I, I, I prefer, I'm fine with Catan. Well, I mean, part of it is that I know that a lot of the money from all these Catan reskins are going to this like humble engineer up in Germany who made the original. And he seems like a really nice guy. So <laughs> that doesn't bother me as much. It's like all the iterations of code names. Like yeah. I have no but, interest in them. But yeah, yeah, yeah. if Vlad is getting rich off of it, good for him. He's one of the best board game designers ever. He deserves it, you know. If I if I designed a board game and it became a mega hit and then like Disney wanted to make a version of it and I'd get, you know, a hundred thousand dollars from it, I'd be like, Yeah, do it. So <laughs> I can't complain that much. <laughs> Yeah. Right. I, I guess when it when it comes to reskins, I feel like I want something strange, but that's just my personal preference, I suppose. Like I saw I saw a Call of Cthulhu reskin of Love Letter that Ooh. looked really hilarious. Ooh. Yeah. 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 Well, I know with the Love Letter reskins, they've they've actually changed mechanics pretty significantly. Like I've heard the Batman one is supposed to be re- like the best mechanically. Hmm. I did not know that. Yeah. So be they're not just track. reskins. And I know there there have been versions of Catan that are just substantially different from from the original. The so, old Star Trek one had some changes. I think I think it becomes a problem when all we're seeing are just re- new versions of old games. But yeah. I think there's still tons and tons of originality and new ideas out in board. Absolutely, games. it it hasn't hit it's you know the annoyance level that I see that I feel sometimes with like movies. That was an amazing segue to Fog of Love, but we haven't pulled Fog of Love from the hat yet. Yes, yeah. <laughs> it that'll, be a, that'll be a foreshadowing <laughs> to Fog of Love, which we'll talk about later. Okay, uh, wait. Uh, Matt, I actually had kind of the opposite reaction, is that I wandered the, um, the hall for a bit, and it was definitely, definitely less overwhelming than PAX East, but I thought PAX East was just more interesting and there's more, more things to look at. And this, it was like, well, there's a bunch of board games, and some of them are probably great, but I don't want to approach someone and have them teach me this game. Yeah, that's true. I really, one of the things I really enjoy at any conference is just like approaching a table and like, you, tell me why your thing is great. Tell me about it. I really enjoy that. And honestly, like at PAX East, I didn't care about all the video game stuff because it was all just like huge screens and... Like the VR stuff was cool to look at for a couple minutes, but I just, I got tired of all that, but I like approaching a game designer and teach me your game. And that's really all, all of this mm-hmm. PAX Unplugged yeah, was. Yeah, so that's what it was. Like, but, but like, I, I could see that like, if you're not, I don't really if want you're to not approach in, these random yeah, people. <laughs> if you're into just like looking at cool things without <laughs> having to have a conversation with yeah the designer so Geisman, though, there wasn't a whole lot. Uh, so like we we went to the booth opposite Love Letter. I'm sorry, not Love Letter, Fog of Love, and there, there was that minis game. Yeah, and that guy literally talked to us for like 15 minutes, and there was no way to get away from him, just because he was. Like, I was in control us. of that conversation. Yeah, yeah. I, when I was tired of him telling me something, I asked him a question, and we talked about something else. I mean, I, I see what you say, Bubba, but. To me, I I found that I th- I thought that was really cool. Honestly, I thought that game looked really cool. Clearly, uh, you weren't into that. You're not into that style to begin with. I don't know. It, it was a minis. It was a hex based minis game. Yeah, it looked decent. It was like a simplified one, right? Yeah, yeah. But no, I I felt like I was in control of that conversation and left. I felt like he would have gone on for half an hour if I had let him. But we had something to do, and so I just left and. I thanked him for, you know, spending the time to demo his thing. And I, I don't know. I felt great about it. I don't know. It was weird. You just left, Bubba. I don't know. I did. You had a different... After like 10 minutes, I was just like, okay, I'm done. There's no way to get out of this. <laughs> yeah, I felt in control of that conversation. I don't know. I guess that's part of being at a convention is you got to figure out how to, like, take advantage of it. And I guess at some point I got comfortable... Telling demoers, you know, well, thanks, bye. Because, <laughs> um, yeah, you can get yeah. trapped if, if you're too nice. <laughs> and now we know who the most socially adept is of us all. <laughs> yes, well, I, you and Wes, well, I think. <laughs> I, so I feel like that there's, there's a, another problem here, and that's the problem that you run into at PAX East is that a lot of these people 
were just hired from temp agencies and then they were schooled on the products for a couple of days and you know maybe even a single day and then now they're manning the booth for that company at PAX East. Whereas here, there are a lot of more people who are more invested in their products and maybe it is like their own products that they're showing off at the show. That's true. I mean, I had, I had like the opposite interaction that Geisman had. My, my first day there on Friday, I went up to the White Wolf booth and I started like trying to chat about RPGs and White Wolf and like be social and do the, do the social mini game with this rep. And it just became painfully obvious that they just did not care at all about RPGs. And they were just there manning the White Wolf booth and there wasn't any merch and there wasn't anybody else to talk to. And it was just like really pretty awkward for everybody involved. Yeah, I think the board game companies are just less organized. I was seeing posts on Facebook in various board game groups where even large companies were like, hey, we still need volunteers. You'll get you know, you'll get a game and a meal stipend and your ticket for free. Please demo games for us. So I think a lot of it might have been just like last minute hassling to try to get people. But the ones I like the best are the ones like you talked about, Matt, where it's just the designer and it's his own thing. And they're just them and like a friend maybe showing you the game in their little booth. Those are always the most enjoyable to me. Yeah, and there definitely were some duds on the board gaming floor. Um, but um, I think I, I was following PAX Unplugged Twitter, and it seemed that the role-playing stuff was definitely subpar compared to what was upstairs. Oh, really? The yeah, yeah, stuff, yeah, the disappointed people. There, there were more disappointed uh, RPG fans Yeah, I can see that. There were a lot of RPG booths out there, but it looked like just like two guys behind stacks of books. Anyway, any, any other experiences from the expo hall you guys had? One of the fun random things I walked past was a like basic reader book, but it was Call of Cthulhu. <laughs> yeah, I saw that. that so it was, was like great. Call of Cthulhu, learn to read or something. It was <laughs> it was pretty great. Yes, for the nerd parent. Yeah. <laughs> I guess that's going to be more of a thing now, right? Because... Oh, it's already becoming a thing. I mean, thing. it's already been a thing, but I, I, I think the nerd parent demographic will only increase now. Probably. It's also easier to find this sort of stuff now, so... Yeah, I don't know. That's that's weird in yeah. my mind. It's, I guess I'll find out more whenever I become a parent. <laughs> and then yeah, you the, will be a nerd internet. parent. All right. Next on the list, what do you what did you guys think of SEPTA? <laughs> SEPTA, the train system, oh, with no. the most oh, awful name. <laughs> so let's start like, this. Oh, there's the sewer by... system. Oh no, that's the train. <laughs> <laughs> no, so I I got there after everybody else, and at one point, like I got on the train to meet you guys for dinner, and I left the building, and I I'm like. I saw items exchanging hands. Like, okay, our Airbnb was literally one block from the train station. And the train station was only like five stops from downtown. On my one walk block or one block walk to the train station, I'm pretty sure I saw two drug deals. And then at the train station itself, someone they they offered to scan me into the train in exchange for quarters rather than paying for a token. And then a strange interaction happened with that person and somebody else who gave him cash from the opposite side of the metro. Full disclosure, like, we actually hired all these people to freak you out, Wes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then the train itself lived up to its name i don't know it was all a very unpleasant experience that i don't care to recreate the the l in chicago was infinitely better and i i think that's saying something oh really i've never been to chicago i don't know the train was smoother than boston's so i give it props for that i thought the train was fine it was fine we we were with that name that name that's an awful name for a train atlanta has that's marta and that sounds like a friendly neighbor it's like hey it's marta coming Coming to pick us up. The sept is <laughs> sept is no good. <laughs> but, but Mark, it's the Southeastern Pennsylvania Transit Authority. They could have made this so you? many different things. <laughs> <laughs> would you would you rather be PETA? <laughs> anyway, next on the list we have 
Bushido, which which uh, Orion and I got to play a this, demo of. Yeah, this game was sick. It was at the Gray, Gray Fox. Gray Fox, that's what it White was. White Wolf, the, Red no, no. Wizard. <laughs> Gray Fox was Gray the name. Fox. Yeah. So Mark went and did a quick interview, and then they're like, we have this cool game. Do you want to see it? And so, sure. And it's this martial arts-themed game. Japanese. Okay. Yeah, and, uh, samurai theme. That's Bushido. Right, and you're playing these... Uh, you're playing a card that lets you roll so many attack dice, and there's attack and dodge and armor dice based on which weapon and which technique you play. But the really interesting part was when you do damage, it gets put on the other person, but they don't suffer it until the end of their turn. So you play and roll your attack and say, I do three hits. And then it's this triangular damage system. So one, three, six, ten, depending on how many hits you take. And then they have a chance to either counterattack or maybe they play a dodge and they roll the blue dice which have more dodges which then basically dodge those hits and push that hit back down the track and then you uh, ultimately you have a life counter and you're trying to you know knock out the other person that's an interesting yeah yeah damage system yeah it was, yeah, it was, it was super really interesting cool. because you're you're constantly attacking and reacting and kind of pushing your luck in some sense mm -hmm. on the damage because like and it, it's really on the knife's edge because if someone plays a really heavy attack card <laughs> and you don't defend at all, they could kill you in one card. Yeah. Like it's that powerful. So you have to react that way. And then the thing we didn't see because I think we were playing very aggressively or maybe just the composition of the deck is that after you run out of your, your five card deck, you have to change your stance, which determines what kinds of dice you can roll. Hmm. Uh, your weapon will have three different modes, I think, like a high, mid, and low stance or guard or something. Yeah, yeah. And then that will determine which dice you roll from your weapon and which ability your weapon gives you. Is this always 1v1 or can you play like 2v2? I don't know if they said. They didn't say. We played 1v1 and that's what they had set up. Uh, the other part that we didn't do is that at the beginning of the game, you would actually draft your deck from a pool of options. So you deal four and each choose one and then, you know, refresh it. They just had drafted some demo decks that were reasonably balanced to, you know, showcase some different things. Yeah, yeah. So, but, so you could go into that with, a, I'm going to try to have a dodge strategy and just be impossible to hit and then wait for my moment to counterattack or something. Yeah, and apparently there's a lot more synergizing with the cards than what we saw in the, in those demo decks. But I got the impression from the guy showing off the game that the draft itself is actually a huge part of it because mm, yeah. you're trying to figure out what kind of synergies they're going for and then counter those as you as you draft it. So it looks really interesting. I don't know. I imagine it's like a Star Realm size box. I don't know. It's only a there were a bunch a of dice of involved, but yeah, beyond that, it was just a deck of cards. Maybe or like a code name size box. Say the name again. Bushido. Yeah, that's I the think that's the samurai code. So yeah, it's a samurai so it's it's game. Gray Fox, and I think it's on Kickstarter next month or next week. Or I thought something. they said it was on Kick. Oh yeah, yeah, like next week. Okay, it'll maybe maybe this like week that. it's on Kickstarter now. By the time this podcast goes up or something, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. They said if I'm going to email them with a quote for their Kickstarter oh, yeah, page, yeah. and then they'll give me a review copy. So Sweet. I'm I'm excited to see how it is. So for those who aren't watching or listening to this live, there's a whole context to what I'm saying right now that you missed that you can access by joining on the Patreon and watching our podcast live. <laughs> How's, that for, so serious? <laughs> How's that for a sales pitch? Oh. <laughs> You get to hear all my flubs. Okay, what's next on the list? Here? We've got Ethnos. This was actually the very first thing I did at PAX Unplugged. Who else played? It was me, oh, Ryan, yeah. and Matt? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So this is a, a new game by Kulmini cool or not that was getting a lot of good reviews. I know Shut Up and Sit Down really liked it. Yeah, we walked in, went straight to the tournament sign-up, which was a horribly organized the first day because they didn't know disaster, what was going yeah. on. And then we got over to Ethnos just in time. 
Yeah. And I must say, it is the most boring looking knife of all of Simon's games. Like, they're known <laughs> yeah. for big, expensive, flashy, you know, obviously it's in the name Minis games, and this was kind of dull looking. It, it kind of reminded me of like a, a Middle Earth kind of like, you know, green, brown, trying yeah. to go for that like art artsy you, with your different races that are all basically Earth people. <laughs> Yeah, but failed, I think, on every aesthetic front. Yeah, I, it was, it's fine. It was completely it's forgettable visually. But it's a game where... It's an area of control game. There's a bunch of different areas, and the point value given to them is randomized each game, and then you randomly select a bunch of different mythical races, like, what was it, centaurs and elves and halflings and dwarves and... Trolls. Trolls and giants. All... Kind of boilerplate fantasy stuff. And then it's kind of a ticket to write thing where you just draw cards or you play cards on your turn. And you're trying to get sets to play down. And then you get points based on how well, big your sets are. And then when you play sets in a specific that are tied to a specific area, you can add a token there to control that area. Right. And then the, the unique, I, I suppose, mechanism of it is that when you play a set, which is called, what was it called? like A, a band. A band, that's yeah. what it was. You choose one of the members of that band to be the leader, and then you get its ability, which will give you some ability, uh, which is really the fun part of the game, is trying to use all these abilities. But the unique mechanism is that you then have to discard the rest of your hand. So it creates a bit of strategy and planning in trying to manage your hand. We had what was it the centaurs that let you play two? Yeah, when you when you lot. play a band led by a centaur, you can immediately play another band. Um, did you say the bands have to either be matching in color or race? Right. So um, sometimes, like I collected trolls once and just played five trolls because I managed to get them. And that gave me a troll token, which was worth extra points at the end. But more often, you would be playing a band of a certain color, so you would choose what your your leader was, so you would choose your ability. Right, right. The centaurs were cool in our game, because you could immediately play another band. When you play a band, that lets you put a token out onto the map. If if the... The size of that band exceeds the number of tokens you already have there. Yeah. So it gets harder and harder to place in a particular section of the map, which was a nice touch. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, it was a fun game to me. I would play it again if I got the opportunity. There's no way on earth I'd buy it because they're just better games, I think. Like, it reminded me so much of Ticket to Ride. Yeah, and th- that was weird because I really liked this game. I didn't think it was exceptional. But I didn't feel the Ticket to Ride comparison the way you did. I guess to me, the drawing wasn't as, I don't know, wasn't the overriding. I mean, it's a game thing. in which you either on your turn draw a card or play a set of cards in order to play something on the board and control area. Like, that's Ticket to Ride. The difference is that in this, it's like an area control trying to get the most. I, but I was more concerned. Region. I mean, I was more concerned with what was going on in that round because there were enough races that, like, you were trying to win, you know, the the biggest tribe of a certain thing or or something else. And like, Ticket to Ride just has an incredibly interesting spatial game going on that this game just doesn't do. Sure, right, right. It has that on it. Okay, here's what here's what it is. Ticket to Ride is that on Ethnos. Ethnos has the the card abilities on Ticket to Ride. But I think the key point is that Ticket to Ride is just more of a tense game. There's a bit of push your luck in Ethnos because there are three dragon cards shuffled into the bottom half of each deck. And once the third one is, is revealed, then that round is over and you play three rounds. The game ends, or the round ends immediately. Yeah, immediately. So towards the end of the game, once the first or second dragon has come out, you're, you're, you know, you start thinking, of, oh, I should... I got to, you know, take a risk here. Do I play my cards, you know, whatever set I have right now just to get a couple more points? Or do I wait another round to try to get one more uh, that'll put me in a much better situation? And that's fine. But I think it works better in Ticket to Ride because at any point in time, anyone in Ticket to Ride can, like, 
block your route and cause you to rethink your strategy for the game. And I think that tension is completely missing in Ethnos. But, like I said, the character abilities in Ethnos are pretty cool. It's a fine game. It just didn't excite me. Next on the list is Exceed, the Exceed Fighting System, as it's called, from level 99. Who did I play with that with? You guys I, again? I played one. I played as well. Yeah, yeah, me and Ryan and Matt. You, you played it next to me multiple times, and I thought it was really interesting to watch. Yeah, so it's a game based, it's a game about like old school arcade fighting games, like Street Fighter. This, this game was like Mortal Kombat in a card game. Yeah. It, I think it does it really well. So I talked with uh, Brad Talton Jr. from Level 99, the designer of the game who designed Millennium Blades, which we, which we I think, all enjoy. And he gave me this demo deck to try out, and it was really fun. It's just two different fighters, and basically you have, like in a fighting game, a horizontal plane that you're moving amongst. And it's all about relative positioning and planning out your attacks. So you have... A hand of cards, you can either play an action and then draw a card, or you can actually strike, which is trying to attack someone. So the actions are draw a card. The actions were draw or move, pretty much. Move, or or you can boost, play a buff to make your next attack stronger. Yeah. That was about it. Some other little things. So basically preparation. Right, and then then you you can strike, which is a simultaneous reveal face down card, and that's when you're trying to attack. The interesting thing about striking is that like in a fighting game, like, you know, Street Fighter or whatever, usually if you get hit first, your attack is canceled. So there's a speed rating on each of the cards and there's a range. So you have to be in a specific range relative to your opponent to actually have a chance to hit. But then there's a speed rating and the fastest attack will land first. And then you, there's a bit of damage mitigation, and then I can't remember the term for the... Guard. Guard. There's some guard on some cards. And if their attack hitting you first exceeds your guard on your attack, you get stunned, and your attack cannot resolve. So it's a really interesting, simultaneous play, rock, paper, scissors kind of thing on each attack. Combined with the spatial element of moving, you know, in and apart, your special abilities and cards, all kinds of interesting things layered on top of it to make the game more The the simultaneous attack mechanism is just fantastic. Like, that made the game for me. Because, like, I might have an attack card that can most likely hit, but I have to consider what your hand size is, what, you know, what your deck... What kind of attacks your deck is primarily made up of? You know, it, any like some of my cards would move before the attack. So like sometimes you would start an attack, and I knew you were gonna kill me if you got to me, but I would move out of the way. Yeah, you dart out of the way. Oh, the other thing is that whenever you land an attack, basically your power meter fills up, and you put these cards to the side, and then those are used to power up your super attacks. Uh, where you spend them basically to do some of your really powerful character-specific attacks, uh, which I thought was really fun. So you're managing that as well. I had a blast playing this the first time. My biggest question would be, like, are these different decks balanced? And I guess you can build your own deck. I haven't looked at that yet. So after I went back to, to Brad and said, you know, we liked it, and he mentioned he might have a review copy for me, and I was able to get one on Sunday. So I have another pack of four new characters, and I gotta figure out how to make their decks because they're not pre-made, and I'm not sure what the rules say about that because I haven't looked at them yet. But I'm I'm super curious. They're sold in basically pack character packs. I think it's like fifteen bucks, and you get four different characters, and you just buy whichever packs look interesting to you. But it it was really the thematic integration of a fighting game like that. I thought was handled very well. Yeah, it was really cool. I was annoyed at first because of the, I don't know, non-deterministic fact that I can't guarantee that my attack lands, that if you happen to have a, or if you play a higher speed, and even if you just hit me for one, then my whole attack card is just, you know, wasted. And that's me trying to, you know, control the situation and plan ahead. But after the first couple clashes or whatever i think i kind of got into it and it was was fun i enjoyed it 
Well, yeah, and even in the two demo characters we got, one was very much more geared towards close range attacks and like faster attacks, and the other one wanted to stay back and do more projectile stuff. I so think, I think that's interesting. I think my favorite card was the lightning dash or lightning javelin or oh yeah, the, the lightning one javelin. that you had to be like across the map and you flew all the way to the other end. Yes. That it showed cool. the guy like kicking and there's like lightning coming out of him. Yeah. And you can just imagine him just flying all the way through the opponent to the other side of the map. Yeah. That was great. Yeah. So I'm really excited to see what other interactions on there. I, 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 I think it's a really neat system. Moving on, let's talk about let's talk about Twilight Imperium, Ooh. which Bubba Ooh. and Orion played. <laughs> New version, Twilight Imperium Fourth Edition, and you finished in what four and a half hours, including drafting the galaxy. Yeah, yeah. Tell me about that. What do you think of the new That's the new crazy. version? It's awesome. It's great. <laughs> Again, it's a game that I already love. And they made a lot of things streamlined, and they made it faster, and it was great. Part of playing this game was, this was kind of my strategy of, of PAX, is that I realized I didn't really want to walk around and talk to people. So I was like, well, I just want to play long games that I don't get to play as much as I might otherwise, so I'm going to go for TI4 because I'm excited about it, and they're running it. So we managed to get into a game of four people. And it actually, we actually finished, like we said, in, you know, four and a half hours or something. It was the fourth round. I managed to score five points and win from, jump from five to ten and win in the fourth round. So that was... That's exceptionally fast. (laughs) Yeah, I, I scored every possible point save one, and there was an extra point available, so... I don't think... You couldn't have won in fewer rounds. We probably could have actually played the game uh, in shorter time. But it was our first time for all of us on TA4. So, But even saying it was four and a half hours... I think, Bubba, you mentioned that it could have been three hours. Yeah, probably. That's mind-blowing. Well, tell me about yeah. the differences, though. Tell me about the... I, I want to hear about... Because I speculated about the new changes when I read the rule book when it was released, but tell me how the, the changes affected the game or what, what you what you found more most interesting about it. I think how they redid the tech tree. In TI3, the tech tree is divided up into these four colors and there's a bunch of different prereqs and the tree is a little convoluted and hard to follow if you haven't played before. And in TI4, they changed it so that there are still the four colors and they still have mostly the same thematic elements, but it's strictly one, two, three, four in each color. And instead of having, instead of you needing specific prereqs for a tech, you need a certain number of that color for for the next tech. So the first one in red, has no prereqs and then the next one requires one red and so on and there's four in each color and then the rest of the texts are rolled into specific ship upgrades so you start with your basic ships and all the stats are on your player sheet and then when uh, you say you research cruiser 2 it's called the subtitle is stasis capsules which normally or used to give your cruisers the ability to carry a ground force Now it includes that stasis capsules one capacity. It includes the plus one attack for Hyler V and it includes the plus one speed from type four drive. So instead of getting a technology that benefits all of your attacks for some ships, you upgrade a specific type of ship. And if you look at the prereqs, I think that one, the Cruiser 2 required like one blue, one yellow, one red, or something like that. Did that result in fewer technologies overall? It's hard to say. Tech is cheaper, but I think also the planets are generally less resources. So that's probably just shifted down a little bit to be compatible. I think everyone bought a tech every time except for Bubba because of the race he was playing, which he can talk about. And 
then the other thing is we finished in the fourth round, so we didn't have time to get to War Sons or Massive Fleets or anything like that. Yeah, yeah. What did, what did you think, Bubba? I guess, first of all, the biggest problem I had with TI3, I remember, <laughs> from playing that, uh, was the tech tree. And I think they did solve a good bit of that. It is still fairly complicated as far as, like, looking at your big deck of techs and figuring out which one you really want to go for. But in general, it's easier to like figure out what you can do. So I, I do like that aspect. Like Orion said, I played a race that couldn't research. I played the viruses. I, I forget what their name is, but the I necro essentially virus, could... The right? The necrovirus. Sure. Essentially, I could uh, steal techs from other people whenever voting happened which is something else that they changed about ti4 um instead of or the politics phase triggering off a policy card i think that's what it used to do it now triggers as soon as someone takes mechatol rex and at the end of every round there's two of these votes and essentially my race got to guess what the table would decide for the vote and if i guessed correctly I got to steal tech from somebody who voted in that fashion, which was pretty interesting. But the game was so short that we didn't really get to do much with it. Wait, you got this? You got to copy it, or you got copy. to steal it? Copy, copy. Okay, stealing yep, it would copy. be nuts. <laughs> <laughs> it would be yes. So those two things were some of my biggest takeaways. The third was simply the fact that it did finish so fast. I am actually slightly worried about how easy, how much easier it seems to get victory points in this game than it did TI3. Granted, we've only saw some of the victory point cards, but I did feel like they were slightly easier just in general. I don't know. What did you feel about that, Orion? Yeah, I think they were on the whole easier. And there were the secret objectives, which was another way that you scored more points. Oh, yeah, that's true. You could get more secret objectives than you could in TI3. Mm. You could get up to three. Yeah, so in TI4, all the secret objectives are worth one point, but you can score up to three of them. And in the same way, scoring a secret objective doesn't block you from scoring a public, so you could score both in the same turn. Yeah, that, that seems like... I don't know, maybe it was a purposeful thing to try to make the game shorter, but we had this problem in TI3, which is why we always ended up playing the Long War variant, is that when we played the normal length game, we found that it was ending right when the game seemed to be, like it was getting to be really good, like right before all the huge battles were going to happen. So we might just have to end up playing TI4, now that we have a copy, with a larger number of points. Like yeah, it, in a game that you need that tension to simmer to really get the the real experience out of it. I think if it's if you can end the game in four or five rounds, you're just not it's gonna not have enough. the same It's not Twilight Imperium. Opera. It's, it's, or, yeah, cosmic it's a four X at opera. that point. It's not the epicness because right. it's just not as big or not as long or as involved or something. Yeah. Well uh, well it needs it needs that tension and the buildup and people, you know, maybe skirmishing a bit, but largely not getting into full scale wars. And then that needs to push over into some big military moves, I think, for it to become a completely satisfying experience. And it's still also, a fun game. In, in TI, in third edition at least, the long war that we play, you can get crushed early. And still come back and have it like build yourself back up because there's just there's enough time, right? And enough rounds and stuff like that. Uh, we got. Whereas we gotta in TI four, if you drive your two biggest ships into a black hole, for instance, you're pretty much done. <laughs> not that, uh, that happened. To yeah, anyone. that was not two. That was four. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta watch out for I, I, black I like to say that I won the game on the other side of the black hole. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in the alternate galaxy on the other end of the black hole, you were a, a fearsome invader for sure. Yes, in the other dimension. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Uh, let's move on to talk about a much more peaceful but maybe no less ruthless game. 
a uh, key flower, which me, Ouch. me, Orion, and Matt. I, I have to say, I was looking back through my pictures uh, of the of the weekend, and maybe the most perfect picture is the one that I took of key flower with you. And you just have this pained face as you stare at the board, like you. It's like you're in anguish, just how hard you must be thinking. Key flower is a thinky game, right? It's really tight, and perhaps as a as an example of that, we actually all tied at forty four points. We played a three player <laughs> game, and we ended up with all the exactly the same number of points, all three of us. And there's no tiebreaker. The tiebreaker is to play another game. Yeah. Which we were not <laughs> in a place to do at that point. No. Yeah, it's a brain burner. It's, uh, it was my second time playing it, but you're, you're both your first time. So did you guys enjoy it? Yeah. I liked it, but it's kind of like Tzalkin of you have to be ready for what you're getting yourself into, I think. I felt like this was a good game that I didn't enjoy enough to play very much more <laughs> yeah it's it's mean like it's an auction game which can always be mean and for a euro game there's a i think a lot of interaction between the players there's a lot of ways where you could really screw people over mm-hmm. particularly when you which you did a couple times to me matt when you play a meeple on one of your opponent's home tiles and then that... What are you talking about? I was giving you free meeples. Yes, you give me the meeple, but it was a color of meeple that I did not have. So I couldn't also play on the tile. Yeah. Because whenever you play a meeple on a tile, you need more meeples of the same color to continue. So there's a lot of blocking and aggravation. Unless you there. get the colorblind power, which I got, which yeah, let me just play to ignore that rule. whatever colors I wanted wherever, which was Which great. is really a kind of unique thing. There yeah. are these special boat tiles that only come in on the second of the four phases, and they had really powerful passive powers on them. Yeah. Which yeah. I don't think I've ever seen anything like that That's letting him just ignore before. all resource specificity. So you could for just, upgrades, yeah. For upgrades. You could just play whatever you wanted. Mine let me completely ignore meeple color. Mine was less powerful. Yours oh, no, just mine gave, gave you a green one. A green a at the end. Yeah. Color meeple. Which didn't round. matter because I could ignore colors. Yeah. So. Yours kind of canceled it out. But I think it's a really intriguing game. But yeah, like Tzulkin, it's one of the ones where I think you have to kind of break through and really start to understand the tile composition before you really get the game. Right. It's, it's yeah. a headache and a half. In a good way to get it, there. It's it's a great... I mean, it just has a lot going for it. The, the center market is great. The The way that you put your little city together as you successfully bid on tiles is great. Particularly since the roads matter. The roads matter. And as you produce resources, you have to actually move them in order to use them on another tile. Yeah, so there's this really competitive bidding process, and then there's also a spatial uh, aspect of it of building your town and having to connect the roads and physically moving resources onto a tile to upgrade it. But if you're not ready for a ruthless auction where someone can just come in and screw you over, you're not going to enjoy this game. Yeah, it's it's an intense Euro. I think it's notable for... You know, the auction is pretty cool. The way you can interact with other people, the summer boat tiles, which I just talked about. Mm-hmm. But also, it's just one of those really well-designed Euro games where there are layers of considerations behind every decision you make. Yeah. And like I think everything, all the... every aspect of the game is purposeful and creates thought and difficult choices. And I think all the systems work together well. Yeah. So you're using these meeples and there's three colors on these different to either produce on a tile or to try to bid and gain the tile and then there's the bidding for first choice of the next boatload of meeples coming in oh yeah and there's moving resources in your hometown to upgrade tiles and there's a lot going on you know where this falls flat the theme is incredibly boring because which is fine like i don't think this kind of game needs that but i was just comparing it to agricola which yeah, I remember like that that, that Wes, Wes loves because of the sense of dread um, and the theme yeah. works with the mechanics. 
in this game, Wes, I don't think you would enjoy this game because there's there's nothing to get attached to. Well, you're in, building up your own little <laughs> village, I suppose. Kind of. I don't, it it but, works well for me because it's very it's very well designed on a mechanical level and I think really importantly in a Euro game, it has very, very clear iconography and graphic design. Uh, which well, you need. with Agricola, it's... To me, it, it because Agricola is set in plague-ridden Europe, basically, there's just never enough. I mean, even if you play the game by yourself, there's never enough for you. There's never enough for you, there's never enough for your family. You always feel torn between really difficult decisions. And I mean, maybe if Keyflower was set in the universe of The Witcher 3 or something, and your village was constantly assaulted by supernatural beings or... You know, every now and then your crops would die and, you know, your children would get diseases and, you know, like terrible things would happen to you. Maybe then I would enjoy Keyflower. But if it's just... It's just your friends honest. taking what you want. That's all. Yeah, there's... Yeah. In Agricola, you know, it's... The game itself is scarce and then everyone else is just compounding upon that. In Keyflower, it's just everyone else's... Even if they're not trying to be... They're just going to be mean to you because... There's so much battling over what's there, it, but it doesn't. It doesn't have the oppressiveness from the game side as Agricola does. Right, and and I don't. I mean, maybe that works in sort of a Hatfield and McCoy kind of way of your your fighting with your neighbors. Yeah. But in the end, what? Why don't you all just get together and start a big village? Like, do, <laughs> do you have? Are, are you all racists? Is that what's happening here? I mean, that's the, isn't, that's the thematic justification we made for Agricola, right? The reason why, like, if, if another family has gone to the fishing hole, why you can't go there is because you have this unnatural <laughs> hatred for being around them. <laughs> <laughs> and that begging tokens are just shame. <laughs> because you can't stand I will, I will to interact make my with wife anyone outside the family. The town square before I share a fishing hole with you. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> but now I'm thinking about a Witcher 3 work replacement game, and I'm going to have to think about that more. That sounds actually really good. Okay. I, I would enjoy it. Yeah. Speaking of another stressful experience, we played a mega game. So good. Oh, so good. We all played it right yeah every all six of us this was the whole yep. team yep which yeah. was yeah. the dream team which was very it was loosely but kind of tongue in cheek based around the book dune because you're you're fighting it, over spice ice ice ice, ice, ice not now, spice i think now, now that i finished now that i finished dune it wasn't loosely based on dune it was literally dune with no copyright infringement <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, it was... No, it's, it's really what it was. Yeah, yeah. Well, it had all these different factions, and there was a map component where you're battling over territory. There was, I guess, the... The high politics way, table. The high politics where there was a, kind of a meta plot of the emperor coming to visit and things were going to happen around that. You'll have to speak more about that in a bit, Wes. And <laughs> but most of it was the rest of it was gathering resources and specifically getting ice, which was kind of a set collection game. And then once the factions got ice, they had to ship it. And there were two factions, one of which was our faction, that were the two shipping conglomerates. And so we were only fighting against this one other team in a room full of what there were eight, ten teams. Eight or ten. Eight teams. Eight so, total teams. Yeah, six houses and then the two shippers. And then the two shippers. And we only cared about shipping more ice. That's That was our only concern. Yeah. But it was cool how it, we still got involved heavily in the political side of things. So Orion was our military general. Yeah, so I was the... Uh, general. Well, tell them about the map. The map strategy person or whatever. And it was this... It, it was two big continents, basically, and there were warp gates connecting certain provinces to the other continent, and there was, you know, three different three different sets of gates, I think, so the, the blue gate connected to the other blue gate, that sort of thing. And then all eight factions had a home citadel where they could place troops, and then they spread out from there and tried to control territory and collect the resources from all these different territories 
uh, some of which was the general money industry and influence, and some of which was the ice, which everyone was trying to control. Because it was victory points for everyone, I think. Yeah. And unfortunately, because we were a shipping conglomerate, I mean, our strategy overall was just like keeping peace for most of the game. So I mean, I, I, I was just playing the chill in Australia and don't mess with me strat. Yeah. Which is all I needed to do because there were no victory points to be gained. I was producing one ice a turn from this one province and I just set up these nice borders and had troops so that if someone wanted to mess with us, I could mess with them, but I wasn't, you know, I wasn't actually fighting anyone. I never got into a battle the entire time. Yeah. yeah. Which I think I was the only one. Yeah, I think it helped us because we were able to make a lot of friends in the latter half of the game. Yeah. What did you do, Ben? I so forget. I, I played the... in the one of the resource gathering games. It was basically pit reskinned to be like a market stock exchange type of thing there's a number of little mini side games basically yeah, yeah, so yeah. It, it, the game itself wasn't anything special i think the best part about the game was that it was like very fast paced and it was over in like five to ten minutes and i could go help with other things <laughs> yeah yeah that was the thing because you matt and bubba were on resource games and right. You generally finished really quickly, which helped me a lot in kind of the yeah. meta game of trying to diplomatize with other other yeah. factions. Matt, well, your game was yeah. So I was at a, it, it was another resource divvying up game. I think there were overall fewer resources at my table, but maybe more special things. Like, did you get most of those super weapon? Yeah. Parts so for I got three weapon pieces early in the game wow and got like a special info card that let me talk to the the guy in charge and he told me what the weapon was so we were the first people to understand what the weapon was i think we were the only people who understood completely what the weapon was even at the end of the game yeah Yeah. that could be which is why it never got used because we weren't interested in using weapons and this is this is a really cool meta part of the game is that all of a sudden in the resource games these little like 3D puzzle pieces started appearing as resources, which no one knows about. And you got a couple, and you're like, should I get more? I'm like, sure. And then we learned that, oh, it's a super weapon whose power rivals the emperors or the empires. And we're like, wait, we're a trade conglomerate. I don't want a super weapon out there. So I literally had, by the end of the game, five pieces of the super weapon in my pocket the whole game. (laughs) And no one ever built it. No one ever built it. Do we know how many total pieces there were? I know purple had three. Okay. There might have been a dozen. I think I had nearly half of the super weapon in my pocket. Yeah. I, and so I think there was more than one. Oh, were there? Someone built yeah, this sure like rocket or something the second to last round, which looked like several of those pieces put together. Oh, but so maybe. I don't know. I think it was just victory points or something. Oh. I don't think it was a weapon. So the most interesting thing at my table was the representative from the other shipper, Offworld Trading Company, was just, he sat down at the table and immediately owned the table. He oh, was just, just he, a really gregarious guy. Huh? Yeah, he just played it like he was a high roller and really hammed it up. I think he, if he had been like at the high table, maybe it would have been more interesting because Oh, I owning mean, my table didn't matter. I actually, I'm glad that guy was not at the high table. Oh, so am I, guys. <laughs> oh, yeah. That would have been really annoying. Yeah. Oh, because he would have singled you out, Wes. He singled me out, and I was just like, well, you know what? I'm going to keep my mouth shut because I don't really care about, you know, the difference of one resource card or something. Yeah. But it was fun. My table ended first every time, so I was working the floor, talking to random people, trying to give Mark information so that he could make better deals. So it was like this big conference room and there were about six people on each team. So probably roughly 50 people playing and then another half dozen, maybe eight people kind of administrating the game. And so there was each team had one person at each of these five stations or roles to play their mini game. And then there were other people floating around. Or once you finished your minigame, you were just floating around, talking to people, making deals, collecting information, things like that. 
Yeah, and that was kind of my role is I wasn't assigned to any of the games, and so I was like head diplomat, I guess, and which turned into making trade deals for us. It turned into making trade deals because we we realized that we were just collecting tons of ice, but we weren't allowed to ship our own ice. Well, we were, but it wasn't particularly valuable for us. I got conflicting reports on whether or not we were, but anyway, okay. What we ended up doing is. Or my main strategy about halfway through the game, once you know other things weren't going so well, and we were behind halfway through the game, I just went to teams and said, hey, if you're one or two cards away from completing a set, ship with us, we'll complete the set for you. And then after a while, I realized that there was I wasn't confirming if they were actually shipping with us. So then I had to set up a system where I walked over and listened to them actually report the set collection process to the person in charge of that to make sure they were saying ship with yellow and then it just it became this giant mad rush and the other teams started finally started having like a point person who was actually submitting the ice which made things better i I had a lot of fun with it because it was only wheeling and dealing and suspicion and intrigue and betrayals at the very end they had like two or three guys who were trying to poach pretty much every person that Mark had arranged deals with to give ice to us or to ship their ice with us. And was that did that happen more than just at the end of the game? Or yeah, were they... the other shipping team was very aggressive the whole game. And I think my they were also aggressive militarily, right? They actually fought with people, yeah. yeah I just I, I was on hurt them. Cause... I was on the smaller continent and there's only three of us there. So we all kind of took our corner and we looked at each other where we're like, I don't want to fight. Do you want to fight? And we're like, I don't want to fight. Do you want to fight? And so we all just, we had our area (laughs) and the other two teams swapped provinces a couple times, but we had a very peaceful continent. The other continent had battles every round. Yeah. So I think our general friendliness helped us out in the end. Was was Blue on the other continent? Yeah. Blue might have fought more than anyone. They were (laughs) always getting attacked by someone. Yeah. Yeah. And then, Baba, you had, like, a, a bluffing mini game. Yeah, I had, uh, like, a, it was, like, blind man's bluff. The only unique rule was if you got your opponent to fold a 10, the highest card in the deck, your team got a victory point, which was fun to do. Like, if it ever came up, it was fun to try to get them to to fold something like that. It was, it was interesting. It was kind of simple, but I think overall... That game had the most resources available of any of the other. You had at least (laughs) twice as many as my table did. Yeah, I think I got more resources total than both of you guys combined somehow. And I again, I think the the highlight was that you guys were able to finish quickly and then help me out and help facilitate communication between like me and Wes and Orion and the other teams we were trying to get on good terms with. Which it was exceptionally helpful. That was a blast. It might not have been till the end of the game when I, I started going to people, but it was fun to like go over to the high table and be like, Wes, we need you know, we need the Emperor to fight. We need to unite against the Emperor or something because of like this I, reason somewhere else. I felt like I was an intern in DC, just like <laughs> sitting yeah. by the high table and like waiting for Wes to motion me over. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. The well, high table no, was an that's area. That's exactly what it was, though. Like yeah. I, I, because the rule at the high table was I could not leave. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. So tell me about what um, went on at the high table because it was a, a land of intrigue and mystery to me mostly. So basically, there was a a control master. I or we just called him control, but we call he was basically the speaker of the house, and he every single round. He would put forth to the representatives a new law of some kind or some kind of dictum that needed to be passed or failed. Um, So, like, for instance, the first round was funding for research for a new method of ice collection that would help everybody collect ice better. And then the next round was, oh, what are the ecological ramifications of this ice, you know, this expedited ice production and so it was it was genuinely all just policy stuff and i mean some of it affected i think some of it affected the war map um and some of it affected the story 
But really, it was just another jockeying of privilege between the different houses and the different factions that people, like later on, things got a little bit more specialized and a little bit more geared towards the overall political climate of go with the Emperor, go with Team Blue. But I, I think my crowning moment of achievement, though, was that Blue, for the first two rounds of that, was very desperate to make friends. And they they wanted to have more influence in the council, um, like actual political clout influence, not, you know, not the currency of influence. And a round came up where the person who contributed the most resources in that round would be able to distribute a certain amount of ice to whoever they wanted, however they wanted. I think it was like, I think it was like eight pieces of ice and they could distribute it how they saw fit. And red and blue, red being the empire, were both really jockeying for that. And blue was trying to call over his runner, but his, his runner didn't see him. And I didn't really care at that point whether we got the ice or not, because I didn't think that we could ship it to ourselves. And I didn't think about the whole completing the set idea and things like that. And so, but, but I did want Blue's business because they were, at, at that point early in the game, they were making a lot of friends and seemed to be doing pretty well. So I actually passed him surreptitiously under the table the resources that he needed to beat Red in that vote. And that just won us a friend for life in Blue. Yeah. Um, and then you and, backstepped them later behind the back, <laughs> right? We we were right actively so, working against the most of the game after that. <laughs> yeah, basically, I I was true politician and just lied through my teeth the whole time <laughs> of where like we would we would we would step away from the table and I would be like, yeah, Blue, we've got your back. I'll help you out, you know. And I helped them out that one time, like in in all genuineness. I actually helped them out another time when I had my intern, uh, Ben, with me, that I, like, I, I gave some resources to Ben and said, go find a blue runner and tell them to give this to them, their representative at the high table. So I, I did it because I figured going under the table again would be a stretch. So anyway, blue shipped with us all, all but one of their shipments, I think, is what they said at the end of the game. And meanwhile, at the table, I'm not being verbally supportive of Blue at all, but I'm helping them do all this stuff. And then in mid-game, Red comes up to me at the end of one of the council meetings and was like, hey, man, we really need your support against Blue. You know, we really we want to ship some ice with you. We want to form a working relationship. And I was like, sure, man, that's great. <laughs> let's, let's, let's do it. And so then I proceeded to very, very successfully play both sides of that. And like there, there were moments where so so blue was anti-emperor and red was pro-emperor. And I mean, th there was one vote about resources to welcome the emperor coming. And I had the resources to help out with that. But there was such heated debate at the table. I just basically claimed Switzerland and was like, look, I'm not looking to make enemies here. And I, I looked really distraught about the whole thing and, you know, didn't, it ended up not putting it in and the red faction didn't hold it against me because of the current political climate. So in some ways I got really lucky and in some ways it was the best bluffing I've ever done in my entire life. Yeah, it was spectacular <laughs> because I'm not witnessing any of the details of what's going on there. All I know is that at the beginning, you know, our main strategy that we're like, okay, I don't care which side we're on if it comes to an empire versus rebellion situation, which kind of looked like where the game was heading. I just want to be on the majority side because then the majority of teams ship with us and that's what we want. And so <laughs> it was shocking to me because originally you're like, oh, Blue's getting lots of friends. Let's sign with Blue. And you we brokered together this, this agreement with Blue uh, for exclusive shipping rights. And then I'm seeing every, I'm talking to people and everyone hates Blue. And I'm like, oh. And then we get offered this alliance with yellow or orange, which was the Empire, and then white and red. And I'm like, great, that's three teams right there and I figure well we'll probably just lose blue they're going to be really mad at us but they seem to be pretty isolated and yet we kept blue <laughs> we kept being the shipper for blue the rest of the game along with all of their enemies we were getting both sides so that was so fun so Wes yeah, it was what, great. 
what happened at the high table that made blue so out of favor or was it at the um, high table well they declared rebellion against the empire at one point like open rebellion yeah. but that was two rounds was... after they'd been fighting the empire on the map so yeah they the blue representative just didn't i don't think he handled the rebellion plot line very well actually they um, played really bad and came in last place so yeah yeah, they came in dead last. Have we mentioned the uh, the meta plot? So the big the big event that changed the game. Have we talked about that yet? The emperor came. Oh yeah, that didn't, didn't change, change anything, anything on the map. map. It didn't but... change anything for us. Side note: the emperor was Tom Vassal of the Dice Tower. Yeah, who was looking very dapper as the emperor. Yeah, he had this his all red ensemble. <laughs> and the on... and he basically came in and was acting like he was really pissed off at everyone. You know, basically, you guys are screwing up my mining colony or whatever. And he challenged. He was like, someone has to duel me. And it was the gregarious guy from the off-world shipping company from uh, from my table that, that dueled him in Blind Man's Bluff. And he beat the Emperor. So that forged like a... Che- la- cheating out of his ass. <laughs> yeah, cheating. Cheating, yeah. <laughs> Which, to be fair, I would have probably done the same thing in his position. Yeah. But but then the last like quarter of the game, cheat? our direct rival ended up basically being the Empire. How do you cheat in a bluffing game? Someone was standing behind Tom and giving him hand signals. Oh, that's dumb. Yeah, yeah. I'm glad we beat yeah, that. That's, that's what Tom was them. mad about then. No, he was mad before that. Yeah, I don't know why oh, he was mad. Okay. But anyway, guys, do, I would wholeheartedly recommend anyone listening to participate in a mega game if they are able. Do you guys agree? Right. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I think my favorite thing about that game was how much the information was fragmented because none of us had a full picture. Even Wes, I think didn't have a full picture. He may have had the fullest picture. Or oh, more, maybe. Pro- okay, the most stressful moment of that entire game was there was a really hurried, very last second calling of the council, or the session of the council, or whatever, and we sat down, and the speaker said, okay, the Empire needs funds to launch a, a series of orbital strikes on the spiders, which were these NPC NPCs that were just ravaging the, the military map, and we had like two minutes to decide on this and and contribute resources and vote on it. And my information at that time was that the spiders were completely indestructible. That's what and they so told us I'm on the thinking, map at the map table. Right, right. And so I had this complete freak out of like, oh no, this is meant to wipe out another faction. Like, this isn't actually going at the spiders. And so, like, I'm trying to pull everybody else who's free from the team of, like, what do we know about the spiders? What can you tell me? Do I, you know, do we want to do this? Is this, you know, is this going to cause utter chaos? Is this the atom bomb dropping? And I, it was just this frantic, like, three minutes leading up to this vote. Yeah. And that really highlights, I think, what a mega game is about, which is dispersed information. Like, it's about communicating with your team and with other people and... The, uh, the fun part comes from just so much lack of communication just from the time constraints and not being able to find the right people and running around. And I think that's, that's glorious. Like it's, it's just a fun exercise in trying to communicate because so much information is hidden from you until it's suddenly revealed. But then they don't give you all the information. You don't know exactly what's going on. I think... That's the fun of it. And that, that makes it a, a very, very unique experience because it's the opposite of what board games usually give you. Like legacy games have tried to do some things like that. But, you know, in board games, accepting legacy games, you have all the information that you could look through if you wanted. So mega games create a very unique interpersonal dynamic that I think is fantastic. So good. All right, moving on. I'm not going to say much about the next one's Imperial Settlers. I think everyone... Wait, who played it? Was that me, Orion, and Matt again? And Bubba. And, and Bubba. And Bubba. Did any of us enjoy that game? It was okay. It, it was okay. It was all right. I'm struggling to remember it, but the I don't with think apples. I did. Oh! The, make a deal with apples. I had so many apples. Yeah. I had an Orchard <laughs> Empire. Yeah. 
which didn't do anything for you except get more resources. I ma- I used apples to gain apple production, which immediately gave me apples. Yeah. And then you had nothing to do with the apples by the, the game. Anyway, it's a game by Ignacy Trevicek, uh, who made Robinson Crusoe, which we all love. And I think it's a it's probably a decent game, but has a very poor first play experience because all of the factions are so completely different. And you really, I think to really enjoy the game, you have to understand those factions. That was my impression. Oh, this is not Catan related at all, is it? No. Okay, Settlers no. threw me off. Yeah, it's just called Imperial Settlers. It's like a mini okay. Civ game, kind of. Not really. It was just it bizarre. Was, it was it's a very strange game. It was like a tableau building. Some of, of the things. decisions of how like production worked were just weird. I think that was the worst part because all the production buildings, when you built them, you immediately got the production. So if you got lucky at the beginning of the game and drew like the cheap production buildings, you could just chain out a ton of them, which both gave you resources immediately to build more stuff, resources for the rest of the game, and victory points at the end. Yeah, so anyway, I would play it again, but it's not a game I'm going to be very interested in going forward. All right, next on the list is my an entry I put in called Being Too Shy to Say Hello to Jeff Engelstein from the Ludology podcast when I saw him demoing his game, his new game called The Expanse. But if Jeff happens to be listening to our podcast, I'm a big fan, and I probably stood there awkwardly too long watching the game progress, and oh I meant to gosh. say hello. <laughs> I was I observing did, the I game, didn't. but it was like I needed to find a time when he wasn't like teaching the game to say hello, and then I didn't. I is, did is the exact same anymore? thing with my Kahulik at Thornwatch because oh, did I didn't you? go and sign up for play Thornwatch with Mike. And oh my gosh, I just, I saw him sitting there judging, like not judging me, but that's actually what the role in that game is called. Right. The GM role is called the judge. And so I'm just like, I'm sitting like 40 feet away from a distance watching him be the judge. And I'm like, ah, that's my Kahulik. Oh, Wes, I was like five feet away. He was like on one end of the table and there were four players sitting there and I was on the other end of the table and I just listened to him teach the game and then didn't say hello. At one point he looked up and like we had like a little like nod moment, you know, (laughs) when you like smile and nod at someone. Yeah, we had that. So I've got that going for me. Yeah, I mean, I I actually, I I talked to him briefly um, on Sunday and I was like, hey, I work on self-driving cars. Here's my cool self-driving car t-shirt. And we had that like brief conversation. There's, I, It started really awkwardly, though, which I guess is kind of perfect for PAX, where I forgot briefly that Mike doesn't like shaking hands with people. Oh, right, yeah. And yeah, he really, really dislikes it. And so I went for the handshake, and he started to reciprocate. And I was like, oh, I'm sorry. And I did the, the PAX X, which I don't know if you... I don't know what that like, is. Oh my gosh, there's a Penny Arcade comic that's probably 10 years old at this point where you just it, you just cross your arms in front of you and make like an X really quick. And that's that's okay. the PAX greeting so that's you don't it. shake people's hands. <laughs> but he, he knew instantaneously what I did and he reciprocated and it was kind of a cool moment. Oh, that's fun. Um, but I just, oh, I just turn into a, an egregious fanboy with those two guys. Like I just, I just want... I want to be a normal person in proximity to them so badly because I feel like I know them better than most people in my life. And I mean, that's what I get for reading all their blog posts and listening to their podcasts and like consuming everything that they've put out there creatively for the past 13 years. Yeah. Yeah. But I just want Jeff to quit his podcast and just be on our podcast every time to share his many wisdoms with us. Because he's way yeah. smarter than me about board games, and I, I want to steal his, his knowledge. <laughs> he also seems really cool, and he designs cool board games. So, hi, Jeff, if you're listening. <laughs> if you're still <laughs> listening. No. Next on the list is the keynote. Who who actually listened to the keynote? I did. I was there for most of it. Oh, yeah. How was it? I was there for all of it. Was it good? Um, overall, like just looking at it objectively as a speech, it wasn't that great. It had some really fun moments, 
but it was really meandering and kind of weird. It, so it was given by Chris Cox from Wizards of the Coast. That's right. Honestly, I was less than enchanted by his intro of him showing baby pictures of himself. <laughs> but maybe that's just because I think all babies are universally ugly. Wow. Um, yeah. So okay. baby pictures and then talking about his youth and his childhood. And if if it had been an amazing speech, he would have put more emphasis on the fact that every game that he ever got into was a social activity and brought him closer together with his fellow human. But it seemed like that's what he wanted to go for, but he kept losing it in some other faff that he wanted to drag in or that he felt so, compelled to drag in from his life. I might have left too early to get the whole thing, but it seemed like he very quickly transitioned into talking about new Wizards of the Coast products, which, oh, to be honest, did. Which, which I was fine with, mostly given like it wasn't crazy good keynote so i was fine with it i just wanted to say that he he talked about the new unset for magic which looks hilarious apparently apparently this is a thing they've had other unsets oh is it their joke sets it's their joke sets so this one's called unstable i'm i'm just looking at a card right now it's called squirrel dealer (laughs) creature raccoon lizard bird when squirrel dealer enters the battlefield Ask a person outside of the game, do you like squirrels? If he or she does, create a 1-1 one, one green squirrel creature token. <laughs> and, and there are like two other squirrel-themed uh, cards, at, at least. That's the best so magic I've card already, I've ever heard of. I've already got a set, or I'm sorry, a case of this set pre-ordered. That's and I great. Will just be drafting, <laughs> drafting into eternity. <laughs> oh man! Oh my gosh! I should pre-order a set of that, honestly, because I really do love those cards too. But yeah, so the the transition, I've never had that happen at a PAX keynote before, which frustrated me about this keynote, where it very quickly became a Wizards of the Coast press release, where yeah. it was like, oh, never, yes. never before seen content from Dungeons and Dragons and Magic: The Gathering, and wait, maybe we're gonna make a Transformers something. I like it was I don't know man I I was not a fan of the whole experience yeah, and I mean even sad. though there were awesome magic cards attached I it was a thoroughly uninspiring keynote that was the last time I went to any kind of big address yeah the I entire mean, weekend I, this is the first PAX I've been to of any kind and that was like that was my first experience with a with an address of that sort and I, I think Ugh. that was the only it put me off of them. I didn't I didn't go to any other ones. You you and I sat in part of oh, Mega Strip, right? Because right. we were tired of walking around and yeah. standing up we and we wanted to, to sit, sit down, down for somewhere. like fifteen minutes because yeah. before the mega game started. Yeah, and then we went to lunch or something. Yeah, but the, yeah. the, the, the yeah. Yeah. Mike and Jerry are hilarious. So yeah. my experiences with Pax keynotes is that they're usually somewhat disappointing. Oh really? What? <laughs> The yeah, one well, at PAX East okay, was fine. Fine. It wasn't amazing. It was I'm the guy probably... talking about like Civ and stuff, right? I, that one was the designer okay. of Civ who talked about how hard, how much he failed at making XCOM, right? Yeah, that one was all okay. Maybe... It was fine. It wasn't it was... like amazing, okay. but it wasn't. I've bad. never seen it. Well, the year before that, game, you know? the year before that was Jonathan Blow who made Braid, and he talked about puzzle games and like what makes a good puzzle game and the uh, that sausage game. That you was remember the best that? one I've seen. Yeah. Yeah, that was a great keynote. And then um, Bernie Burns did the keynote for PAX Australia. Like, there's PAX keynotes are, are usually awesome. This one was just so meh. Yeah. Well, hopefully they the get fact, a better one next time. The fact that I didn't even know it was the keynote probably says all that needs to be said. Yeah. I, I, I literally think so. thought it was just a Wizards of the Coast marketing thing when I sat down. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There you go. That's all you need to know. Anyway, moving on to something more happy. Cheese steaks. What did you guys think? <laughs> Cheese steaks. <laughs> Going into the weekend, I set the uh, over underlined at two and a half. Yeah. I think Matt ended line. up at three. Mark and I ended up at two. Anyone else track their cheesecake consumption? Cheese I, steak. <laughs> I only right, yes, one, cheese unfortunately. Steak. I, I missed oh, the, okay. the first ex- excursion. Right. Amber to, uh, had a cheesecake. 
<laughs> she did. She ate one bite and rejected it. <laughs> that was, that was I like, ate that was far more of that cheesecake moment. than Amber did. <laughs> that was the most hilarious moment to me because I, I looked, when I got to Philadelphia, you had asked me if I wanted a cheese steak. And I was like, oh, you guys are going to go get cheesecake. Eh, I'm okay. No, wait, never mind. Get me a cheesecake. And then, then, then Orion was like, no, we meant cheese steak. And I was like, okay, I'll get me a cheese steak. That's great. And I go and meet them. Well, we said we would. The bowling alley. Yeah, you, I meet you guys in the bowling alley, and there's no cheese steak, but there is cheesecake. <laughs> yeah, we, we forgot like, to wait, get what? a cheesesteak. No. <laughs> but Amber bought a slice of cheesecake, <laughs> ate a bite, and then said it was no good. <laughs> oh, my. Oh boy. So anyway, speaking of that, we convinced Mark to walk a mile and a half <laughs> for science. Oh no. So we went to Pat's and Gino's. Compared and, them. And we compared Pat's, them. To, Pat's was infinitely superior. And we all agreed, I think, that Pat's has the better cheese steak. For sure. Gino's the melted cheese the is still a little bit gross, but it is part of the cheese steak, and that one was no. definitely better. Pat's had the industrial idea. yeast cheese paste. Like that's the best. Ugh. Mm. Honestly, it's I not don't... real. Che- it's not real cheesesteak cheese unless it comes from a gallon can. <laughs> okay, so maybe that was, that was least... maybe that was our mistake. We got the provolone because I was like, that's a, that's just a that's superior a cheese. cheese. Yeah. And it was kind of dry and underwhelming. And then the Pat's ones had, they like scooped it with a spatula out of a vat and just slathered it down, I guess. For as much as Mark hates walking, when he has to walk, he walks ridiculously fast. I just wanted to get there. I was so hungry. And yeah. I knew we were walking it's, a mile. No, and Mark, half it doesn't matter how hungry you are. You I think you were walking an eight minute I... mile. I, I jog slower. Or, yeah, I jog slower than you walk. I was walking fast even for me because I was angry that everyone else wanted to go to the tourist trap of Pat's and Gino's when we probably could have Googled and found a much better cheesesteak venue. <laughs> so I walked quickly because I was also very hungry. But you agreed because science needed to be done. Well, because I was outvoted. Anyway, I was kind of <laughs> underwhelmed by the whole cheesesteak experience at large. They were good. I Okay, so the Pats and Geno's were okay. Pats was better. And then I had one at Pax from the food court, food court which was disgusting. Of course. I mean, I, I should have thought it was on that. par with Pats. Okay. I, think I thought it was much it's worse. Possible, but... It's possible that the true cheesesteak experience in Philadelphia, you have to go somewhere to, and genuinely put your life in danger so that you're not just experiencing the cheesesteak, you're also experiencing the gift of life. It's just... <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's why people think it tastes it's, good. It's just an inferior sandwich to the Permani Brothers fries and coleslaw on the sandwich. Oh, yeah. Oh, in, in the battle of absolutely. sandwiches from Pennsylvania, the Pittsburgh sandwich from Permani's is a million times better. True facts. Excuse me. Excuse me. The Pittsburgher. Oh, is that what it's called? Yes, the Pittsburgher. All right, <laughs> we gotta Sorry, make those us here West again. Coast kids. I made a very convincing replica before. We gotta do that this week. I gotta do make it some again. Mayonnaise. Yeah, yeah. All right, moving on to something else delightful, other than cheese and steak and bread and sandwiches. Fog of Love. Oh, oh this go, game wow. was this game was so great. So <laughs> this was a great experience. We gotta start from the beginning. It's a game from a guy. He's not Polish. He's Danish, I think. Anyway. It was the most interesting game at the show because I had heard about it just a couple days before because he posted his story on Reddit. And then he had a huge booth that had, what, an hour and a half line basically all day, every day to play it. I think it was the only booth with a noticeable line. Yeah. At least on Sunday when I was walking around. And it's a two-player game about navigating a relationship and it's actually something you know we we had a podcast just a couple of weeks ago where we said that romance was probably an impossible theme to do and now this game is challenging all of our preconceived notions and i haven't played it yet but it looks amazing bubba and matt played it and you guys loved it right it was was phenomenal it was certainly by far the most interesting thing i did at pax what can you tell without spoiling? Because it's kind of, there's like a walkthrough tutorial, which will introduce 
you you didn't you seemed to not want to spoil anything for me. So what do you feel comfortable telling the audience? Well, here I'll start with the experience of like Bubba and I came, went up to the booth on Saturday and managed to pretty quickly talk to the designer and. It was just incredibly interesting. The games, there are like eight of these games laid out on tables, and they're beautiful. Oh, yeah. And they, got the, they have the white background board, like Takaido, yeah, which, which makes with, any game look classic. With just nice blue and pink tokens. And we were like, well, there's a line. We'll come back tomorrow, hopefully, and play it. Well, the next on Sunday, the line was way worse. And so we were not going to wait. But... I guess we got our hands on a review copy. So Bubba and I um, ended up taking that and just went to the free play area and, and, and opened it up. To my surprise, the the game is set up to really like walk you through playing the first game in an incredibly unintrusive way. It's just all of the piles of cards have numbered cards that basically explain how things work yeah so i was gonna go read through the rules as matt was like taking out all the components and literally the first sentence in the rule book is do not read this rule book (laughs) and it's just like a pile of cards that said it says like go through these cards in order read them as they come up and it will teach you the game and it it did just that and i've never seen a game do anything like that and it was it was perfect for it. Um, you basically you just you played through a few rounds, and then it introduced you to something new about the game, and you did it again, and then it introduced you to another rule, and like gave you examples as you walked through them too. It was very very cool in that sense. But as far as the game goes, like like uh, Mark said, I don't think. I would want to spoil much other than let's let's tell about our characters, Geesman. Yeah, yeah. I think we can do that. Sometimes. Because I mean the whole game is you're playing two people who enter a relationship. Sure. And like so I, I was playing the female in the relationship and uh one of the best parts about the game is you get to essentially choose the personality or I'm sorry, not the personality, but certain aspects about the character that you're dating or having this relationship with. So, for example, I gave Matt's character glasses uh, that were, I forget what type of glasses nerdy. they were, but they were like, oh yes, nerdy glasses. Uh, <laughs> he was... Which he paired was so well show. with my bedroom eyes. <laughs> Yes, he was a TV show character that acted uh, in TV shows and uh, had bedroom eyes and nerdy glasses. <laughs> and on the other hand, I was a female that uh, was a very politically driven individual, and Geesman gave me... I, I ended up giving you old-fashioned clothing, and that was kind of like the oddity in your very, like very forward personality i don't think i don't think that actually came up very much and then your your secret was that you uh you were also stoned um (laughs) so just like you know just constantly stoned no i think it's more in the after party i mean she was a she was a driven politician but you know sometimes in that kind of life you gotta blow up some you gotta blow up some speed <laughs> blow up. You gotta blow up some steam at the after party. <laughs> nice. Um, yeah. So those were traits, but then we also had I forget what the other things were called, like deeper aspects of the personality, which were hidden. So those were five choose three for yourself, and then these traits we've been talking were five choose three for the other person, and. The way that you play the game, you you describe the person as if these were the things that originally tra- attracted you to the person. Oh, that's great. And so it was incredible how it drew you in to the role playing. Like it might be the most natural role playing of any board game I've ever played because right from the get go, you're describing the person as if, you know, I, I was just like, you know, like, 
I was like, oh, I forget your, I'll just call you Bubba. Bubba, after the, you know, just the way that you presented yourself in the big room and uh, just had total control over, over that, you know, political whatever event. I thought it was kind of uh, kind of endearing that you were a little bit stoned in the after party, you know. <laughs> so anyway, just you know. Oh, uh, this explains so much. The two guys like sitting next to you, setting up the Pathfinder game, looked so uncomfortable, <laughs> and looking, and just kept looking in your direction. And now it makes so much more sense. And and, and, and I want to say like the stone thing was like an outlier like most of the interactions were far more realistic and uh sure like like one of the like you were a tv show actor and like the way i described you or the way i described how your eyes got me was hey i saw you in one of my favorite episodes of this show you were acting in and this one scene really got me going because you were like lying down in bed with this girl and your eyes just did it for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think we probably got looks for that. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, minor spoilers how the game plays out, but I think this is safe to know. Basically the game is played in three acts, which are made yeah. up of scenes yeah. and the scenes are cards you hold in your hand uh, that you play, and then it'll be some situation. They can fall under uh, different categories of sweet, serious, and drama. But when you play a scene, it'll have you kind of like describe the situation, and then you'll make a choice, and either you'll make the choice, your partner will make the choice, or you'll both make the choice. And depending on how the results play out, like different tokens will get placed on the personality board and your happiness will be adjusted basically. But it all happens in so such natural ways. And the way that these scenes play out, it's so natural to build this story. So like one scene plays on the next. So like we, I don't know, Bubba, you took us to like your in-laws on one scene. Yeah. And we and both... They, they like, I got pissed at you because... I forget exactly what happened, but the in-laws said something and I got mad about how you approached it or I wanted you to support me and I got mad at you because you did that or something like that. Right. But, well, but yeah. But then, then later we, on, we, we went off on that and that, like kept coming back to that later on. And it, the game actually kind of, uh, there, there was a, uh, climax, the, the penultimate scene, uh, that just had a really amazing kind of, relationship moment so i it was the game i couldn't believe in one playthrough how it captures kind of the depth of a romantic relationship so i'm excited to play it more because it was so out there you know maybe it'll fall flat on the second and third play but definitely the most exciting thing i did at pax i don't know, i can't wait to play I, I can't wait to play with amber and i i hope it blows my mind as much as it did your guys because it's such a unique theme and such a unique take, and it looks beautiful, and I want more board games that try to do something crazy like this and do it successfully, and apparently do it incredibly thematically, tied to the theme so well that you guys just described a game of this to me, and I still don't really know how it plays, but I feel like I understand the game. Like That's a remarkable feat in board gaming, so mm -hmm. I hope I enjoy it. And I'll be playing it very soon. Moving on to my favorite game of the convention, Downforce, which was the last game we played after Keyflower because we had like an hour. And I'm like, well, I'll go grab a game that won't take very long. And I knew that Downforce was getting good reviews from restoration games. And I knew it's a light racing game. I'm like, great. That's a great way to kind of wind down after the mental stress of Keyflower. And it was amazing. Yeah, it was great. This was just really simple game, really tight, just like two mechanics, and it was it was just a blast. Yeah, so it's a it's an F one racing game. You have your track, you have six cars, and at the beginning of the game, you bid on which you get a giant hand of cards, and these cards have 
Each card will have between one and all six of the different card colors represented, and it'll show how far they go, uh, or, or like a, a distance number for each card, from most to least. And so you get this giant hand of cards, and then you bid on which car you want to own, basically. And the money you bid on, on the cards that you win, get deducted from your points. Your points is basically money. And then in the game, you all go around and just play a card on your turn, and you resolve from top to bottom how far each color is going to go. And at three points during the race, a car will pass a yellow line, and then everyone secretly marks which car color they think is going to win. So you're also betting on the race. And then you get points for your successful bets, and you get points if you own the cars that did better in the race. You just subtract that from what you bid on, and that's the whole game. And it's so fun. It was so fun. Yeah, it really was. It's, it's incredible how mechan- like mechanics that simple just was like immediately fun. It's beautifully elegant. It's beautifully elegant, and um, the board is beautiful. It's just like... It's just like a solidly put together gaming experience. Yeah. And, and the fun part is that you have to resolve the cars. You have to do all the colors and you go from top to bottom. You go from top to bottom. So there are a lot of choke points on the track. Where especially like only, on the curves. Or the especially tight on curves. the curves, yeah, where only one or two cars will fit. And so you sometimes want to push ahead maybe a car you don't own just to make sure they're blocking the track for your opponents yeah. and you slow them down where you're trying to catch up from behind or yeah. maybe you, you purposely don't move as far with your own car just so it can sit in a curve and block everyone else. Yeah, You're constantly like trying to put yourself just in position that like it forces other people to move you before they can right. move. Um, so you're just trying to like squeak out as much value from other people while giving other people as little value as possible. And then the other cool part is that there's no, everyone has to own at least one car, but besides that, there's no limit on how many cars you can have. So in a three player game like ours, it ended up being that we each had two, but it could have been that one person owned four cars and the other two people only owned one. And it still would have been a balanced game because the cost of those cars is deducted against your points. So it's not worth it unless they do well. And it's balanced in that you could do exceptionally well betting on cars that are not your own and still have a chance, even if your cars that you do own don't do that great. Like the the payout scale seemed very well manufactured. For, the, for each of those things. Yeah. The yellow car was the fastest. Oh, yeah, man. Yellow dominated. My, my green car had a great first third of the race, and then Orion just stepped on the gas. <laughs> yeah. And it played in, what, 40 minutes, including learning? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I, I, I've only played it once, but I, I wholeheartedly recommend it. It was great. You bought it on the spot. Uh, yeah. I, I out, immediately yeah. walked over and bought the game. It was that good. This Restoration Games is redoing a bunch of old games. I saw Stop Thief out. and That was the first one they did. You know, I, I played the original uh, about a year ago. from Like, copy from the 70s. It's not a great game, but like I just want, I want to play this new uh, version of it. It's just this ridiculous... It's like a mystery game. Right? It's a mystery game with a big cell phone that like tells you where the thief is. You have to keep calling it that. I just think it's really cool that they're redoing these uh, old games in a way that makes them relevant. I, I, I mean, that's their goal, yeah, and they the certainly did that with Downforce. So yeah, big success there. And then finally, another game that we've been dying to play, and finally got to play: Mechs versus Minions, which yes. was last. Who? Rocket Whoopsie! <laughs> <laughs> yes. uh, the giant game from Riot, who do League of Legends. It's a co-op. Programming. programming game yeah which program games are always fun we love space alert this one is not real time but it has lots of zaniness this is more like robo rally right yeah. yeah this this felt like just a better version of robo rally to me yeah i completely agree and i love how the, the best part of the game i think is how the damage is done because when you take damage you draw a card and most of the time it'll go into your program slots but that's determined by a dice roll. So then it's just another random effect that gets put into your your track that you have to compensate for. Yeah, so the categories of things are like 
turns move turn or attack basically. move yeah move turn or, or attack and there are a couple variations of each one so there may be five or six different colors of cards uh, and the other cool thing is that they stack so if you end up with three blue cards in a slot you get to do the third tier action which will be way more powerful mm-hmm. which is a really cool it's a, it's a cool way of having progression in one yeah. of these the programming games. The most unique games. part was the fact that you leave your cards on the programming track. You only draft like one or two each round, but you build up this programming track over the course of the scenario, and then you add these damage um, mishaps or whatever. So maybe you've got this nice like turn, move, shoot, you know, combo set up, but then suddenly you move backwards four times right in the middle of your nice little progression and you can't go where you want to go anymore until you stop and repair. Yeah, yeah, really fun game and the production obviously is off the charts. Oh, the minis are incredible. It could have been done with tokens or like little plastic minis or like whatever, but they're all these, and they're all mostly, there's like three different types of the minions, the enemies that you're fighting, but, you but there's like got to be... 200 of them. Yeah, there's like 200 of these individual minis in their own little slot in a whole bunch of trays in this big box. It's it's crazy. It's, yeah, it's, yeah. it's, it's in excess of what they could have done, but... It oh, it's great. It looks here. amazing. You yeah. see all these little figures marching around. And, and there are hordes of them. Like, so oh, yeah. many of them pop up each round. And then later on, once you've stacked up and upgraded these cards you can wipe out a whole row of them at a time or different yeah. things so yeah. it was a blast yeah the rocket whoopsie was the best though because <laughs> that was a damaged card that i drew that happened to go at the very end of my programming track so i just it ended up being of great help for me because what it did was shoot me forward three spots and then make a 180 degree turn <laughs> So I just set myself so I'd be facing a line of minions at the end and then just plow through them. <laughs> it was it was really funny. This was a blast. Well, whenever it comes out, I will definitely look at getting it. Um, I think you could. That's it, been it, out. It sold out. Anyway. I mean, I thought I they're thought it was out of like stock. They're going. To, they're doing a third printing. I think. Are they? Okay. Yeah. And there are a bunch of different scenarios to go through. It's kind of mm-hmm. a campaign thing. Just solid fun. I think. Yep. Although we already have quite a campaign of campaigns to do. I know we have so many things to play now. Oh, man. Yeah, our table here is stacked full of new games, and this is not even all of them. All right, that is two hours of reminiscing about PAX. It was just a blast to go to Philadelphia with all you guys, um, especially Bubba and... and uh, in Wes, I don't see you guys in person nearly as often. So it was a blast going back to the Airbnb and hanging out in the evenings. So yeah. playing board games all day uh, for a weekend. It was a great experience. Woo-hoo. Yeah, I'll definitely be returning to PAX Unplugged next year. I think it's a great convention. I like it. I liked it a lot more than East. Yeah, as an overview, I loved it. It was a great experience. I probably enjoyed it more than East. I think I kind of paced out my social interactions better so I wasn't exhausted and just done by Sunday morning. Played lots of games. I think there were definitely some growing pains of the first time running this. They didn't have all the organization down, which I'm sure will improve. But yeah, it was was a great time, great experience. I would recommend and will probably go back. Anyway, thanks for listening to the podcast, everybody. Check out the thoughtfulgamer.com. Don't forget to rate and review this podcast on iTunes so we can keep moving up the rankings. And check me out on Facebook and Twitter. And also, as I said before, if you contribute to the Patreon, you'll be able to get a live feed of this podcast and see all of our blunders and silly, horrible jokes that we edit out uh for the for the actual podcast and be able to talk with us over the chat and everything which i think is a cool reward among other rewards so check out patreon.com slash the thoughtful gamer thanks for listening we'll talk to you again soon goodbye